Good evening. Right. Thank you. How are you? Now, it's fantastic that you could join us because you've had a very busy time. I believe you've been in the edit suite all night. What are you up to? I'm uh, I'm finishing off the next film, which The Islands and the Wales took five years. This has taken just over five years. I was hoping it wouldn't, but it has. And uh, this is the, the ultimate week of the edit. So okay. it's, um, yeah, you can see the jaded face. Yeah. Any clues on the themes or will that spoil it? Um, I spent four years right up to when the pandemic started actually filming cowboys who gather um, to share poetry. They're, they're cowboy poets. Oh, Couldn't be further from the sea. I was in Utah and Nevada, so I went yeah from one extreme to the other. Yeah, yeah. Sounds fascinating. <laughs> now you, uh, you trained as a lawyer. Um, why did you ditch a life of law for one of adventure and film in the high seas? <laughs> uh, I guess being a lawyer was my was my gap year. <laughs> was my year out. Um, I mean, I was doing photography and, and writing and things before that as well. Um, but yeah, I was briefly a lawyer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think we uh, a thing or two about pans and tilts uh, when you're studying law, I think. So you found your natural <laughs> vocation, but I'll just very briefly uh, introduce you, Mike, and uh, won't hold uh, people for too long here. Uh, so uh, you're a Scottish director and cinematographer. You're the founder of uh, Intrepid Cinema, which you established in 2009. Uh, and since its founding, you've produced films for clients such as BBC Scotland and Lexi Cinema. Uh, it's also given you a chance to explore, explore um, aspects of the planet and share with us why it is so important that we protect it and keep it safe. The Islands and the Whales, which is the, the subject of, of, of this event largely, um, is a documentary that travels into the lives of a group of people whose food supply has been affected by the toxic toxicity in the oceans. And that will become very clear uh, very soon. Your debut film, however, The uh, Google Hunters of Ness, uh, that was also screened on the BBC, as was the Islands and the Wales, uh, and it's been shown internationally. Now, that's another very interesting uh, documentary, which documents the last 10 Scottish seabird hunters uh, on their traditional uh, annual gannet hunt on a remote island in the Scottish Outer Hebrides, and I can't even pronounce the name of that island, I'm afraid. But it was quite unique because it was the first time since 1959 that the hunters had allowed their hunt to be filmed and it won various awards. So um, I think what we will do, uh, Mike, is show the trailer for uh, The Islands and the Whales and then we'll take a look very briefly at uh, the Guga Hunters of Ness. So if my colleague, John, could go into the screen, screen share function. And this is a couple of minutes long, this trailer, so uh, it's very revealing. So fire away. For doing bro, Jowlian, like Nick Pamela on the first year. Such a person like a barbara, like a early primitive first, huh? vi kunde visa att standarden är så hötter och betalda så då är det så att man ska säkra dig. Ta hem och se vad äta. Handlar det runt jag har. Vi har det grunda spik som man tar. Vi har det fräska grunda. In other countries, it would not be allowed to sell meat that contaminated with mercury. And uh, at first, uh, trust the other speech of the man of faith. The 
we don't come with our advices now and saying you should be take care, it will be too late. We'll get down in the water between a knife and a whale. I'm a retired uh, United States federal agent. We will stop the grin. We will interfere. We will not allow this to happen. We are just going to pause while we still have the screen up here, uh, Mike, because uh, your earlier documentary, The Guga Hunters of Ness, there was a film made about what goes on behind the scenes, which sometimes you don't see in documentary works, except those of like David Attenborough and such like. But the the um, the risk that the uh, very small team of uh, you and your colleagues undertook to get those shots was just really quite incredible. And I'd say that the behind the scenes stuff is just as gripping, if not more so, than the actual documentary itself. But I think it would be really worthwhile uh, to just show a few minutes of that, just to give people an indication uh, of, of what was involved in that first documentary, which is very uh, reflective of uh, what was undertaken in the island and, and the whales. So we'll run with that. And if you want to stop it before it finishes, Mike, just pipe up, please. The Guga hunt seemed like an unlikely tradition to continue, so I wanted to document this unique tale before it vanished completely. So I travelled to Ness with my co-producer Andy to see if we could film this age-old pilgrimage to the island of the Guga. I met with the leader of the Guga hunters, John McFarlane, and he invited me to film the hunt. I was the first to be allowed to do so in nearly 50 years, so after two months of preparation, we returned to Ness. The hunt is only allowed to take place far out in the North Atlantic, on the island of Sulisker. I couldn't stay on the island with the hunters, so we had to charter a vessel that was able to get us to the hunt and serve as a base to work on the film and sleep every night. I put together a crew of experienced sailors, well used to the challenging conditions that we would face that far out in the Atlantic. Myself and my brother Matt would skipper the boat, with crewman Aaron Sterrett and engineer Will Brown. It was producer Andy's first time at sea. Probably one of the smallest production offices you'll see, but nevertheless, fine one at that. Give you some scale, show our working environment here. You pretty much fit your head in this bit, which is nice, so you know, it's a headroom here. During the first week of filming, we'd suffered a number of disappointing setbacks. Storm damage to our boat meant that essential repairs had to be completed before we could leave port. Adding to our problems, the weather was unusually bad for the time of year, leaving us stormbound and storm away for days. The hunt only lasted for two weeks, so we were fast running out of time to reach the island and film the hunt. It was crunch time. So as soon as the repairs were finished, we had no choice but to set sail into the gales. The suit is getting fast. Are they all 
all ready for the journey? We couldn't afford any more setbacks. If we had any more breakages on board that forced us home, we would have no film. I think it's fair to say that Perseverance made this film, and nothing proved that more than this final voyage. We had to leave in the dead of night so that we'd arrive during daylight. Seasickness and lack of sleep took their toll on these gruelling trips up to the island. After 18 hours of sailing, we finally reached Suosker, a tiny dot on the map, and not much more than a small chunk of rock on the horizon. As we approached the island, the weather got rapidly worse. Large rolling waves turned into unpredictable breaking surf. Suddenly, a huge freak wave broke over the boat, which swamped us and made us capsize in the rough seas. When the boat righted herself, we discovered a serious problem. Will had fallen all the way from one side of the boat to the other during the capsize. Fortunately, his harness had stopped him from going overboard, but unfortunately, he'd smashed into the engine controls as he fell, totally destroying them and jamming the engine in neutral. We couldn't land safely without our engine, and conditions were getting worse fast. Our worst fears were coming true. The film seemed yet again like it might never be finished. Sulisker was too small to give us shelter, and the deep waters and rough seas made it impossible to anchor there. So we decided the safest plan was to head to North Rona, the only other island this far out in the Atlantic. Rona was a larger island, and we hoped it would offer enough shelter to carry out repairs. So with no engine and a small amount of sail, we needed to surf the 11 miles to Rona through the monstrous waves before the weather got really nasty. Adrenaline staved off the seasickness as we pushed the boat's capabilities, reaching 13 knots grinding down the faces of the breaking waves. Wave. All the way to North Rona, four of us had to watch backwards for rogue waves that might swamp us again. You look behind you, it's scary. I'm looking this way. We'd heard tales from fishermen of an old mooring at Rona, but we didn't know if it still existed or how secure it would be, especially in this bad weather. Finding the mooring and picking it up under sail was no simple task either, so it was a big relief when we spotted it and managed to tie up. We didn't entirely trust the mooring, but it was by far our best option at the time. It looks like we're alright, but we're going to have to have someone watching the transit, a transit line. I think that pinnacle to the rocks behind it is the best one for that. We wouldn't have much time to react if the wind came slightly more to the north to avoid that. No. Second, truly. Right, let's get this throttle worked on. How's the morale right now? Good. Well. Well, it's, what's, what time is it? What day is it? A but we were all massively disappointed knowing that we'd come all this way again and might not get to finish the film after all. The controls were totally destroyed and we had very limited tools to try and fix them. But then Will had a brainwave for a rather unorthodox and radical solution to our problem. And we're gonna test it with just gear throttle. Right, so let's see, wow, that's a bit of a revamp from last time we were here. Okay, it's running. throttle first. Yep. Throttle is working absolutely yeah. perfectly. Now I'm going to go into head. Kick it into forward. 
give it a kick ahead. <laughs> oh! Now we can charge the batteries, no problem. We were all so relieved to have our engine back, but we were now well behind with the filming schedule. We bunked down and tried to get some sleep after over 24 hours of sailing, but one of us always had to remain on watch because as it got dark, the wind got up and waves started breaking around the boat. This is our position here. This is Rona in the North Atlantic. And the wind is coming from this direction. So we're totally exposed to waves coming in like this. The reason we're rolling is because the waves, the wind's pushing us that way, so we're holding like this. But the waves are coming in and hitting us beam on, so we're rolling. To summarize, we have a lot of waves. There's a lot of waves coming from a lot of different directions. And a lot of waves. Very uncomfortable. Oh, it so. makes for great sleeping. The wind swung round so that we're now exposed here completely in the wrong direction and it's, it's kicking up a bit of a swell but the, it's actually breaking so we have breaking waves around us. It's not big at the moment but it seems to be picking up fast and the boat is uh, moving quite, quite a lot. So. Um, we're just going to keep someone on watch at the wheel all the time and they're going to have to be ready to start the engine and uh, hold our position. Um, should something happen to the mooring, if the waves running in here get out of hand, we're going to have to move. That's, that's the real issue. So, um, just to keep an eye on it. After getting what felt like five minutes sleep, we set sail at dawn with our rope-controlled engine. It took three hours to reach Sulisker. The weather had turned in our favour. I landed with my camera and headed up the cliffs. And finally, I was able to finish filming the Guga Hunters of Ness. I think that was worth uh, worth viewing, Mike. Um, <laughs> what a laugh. Yeah, you don't seem to be wearing a life jacket. Or, you know, no, it? no, we have them on. They're automatic they ones on, with right? the canisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. What <laughs> that snippet did not reveal is that the bow actually capsized. It was, it was knocked over, wasn't it, completely? Pretty much. We were, a few we were about five degrees off horizontal, but we were kind of skidding down down the wave with the mass pointing forward um, yeah. wasn't wasn't ideal. Yeah. So this this image uh, uh, is uh, the stills photography that's in the exhibition. Tell us about the connection uh, between uh, the islands and the whales and the Guga hunters of Ness. Could you? Because there's a direct well, well, Sulisker and North Runa are actually the closest pieces of land to the Faroe Islands. Um, and that mooring that saved us was actually, part of, the legend is that it was laid by a, a fairies boat at some point. So, um, and then we got through that storm and we were back in the harbour. Um, our boat was completely smashed up. It was a charter vessel that was on its last legs, which we didn't know. It was literally on its last cruise with us. Everything fell to pieces in that storm. So we were doing our repairs and behind us was a fairies vessel that had been through the same thing. Um, and we're also confused as to why anybody else would be sailing around that part of the world. It's not a typical cruising area. Um, and so we said we've been entrusted with filming this tradition that they hadn't allowed to be filmed for 50 years. And of course, the other place that hunts seabirds, it's illegal everywhere in the EU, but the pharaohs are not in the EU. So they still hunt um, a lot of different species of seabirds including gannets um, on one island, which I should, in fact, a photograph of it is in the exhibition called Mijinus. And um, so we were, we were sort of invited up to film the hunting, but of course the story was much, was much bigger than just, just the hunting. And um, 
And two years later, of course, the activists went up as well. So um, the story the story grew quite quite rapidly after that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank they were you. very intertwined. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for that. Well, let's run through a few of the images, and you can pass comment as we go. Before we uh, we invite uh, our guest on quite shortly. So uh, this is the image of one of the islands. It's an archipelago of, of 18 islands, isn't it? Faroe Islands. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And most of them are all connected by tunnels, I believe. More and more. Not as many when I was there, but now, yeah, there, there is some busy tunneling going on up there. It's yeah. fantastic tunnels, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just keep going through the images, John, there. Um, into the net. So this is Mijinus. This is in, in the film. We were um, privileged. I was told I was the first foreigner to go on off those cliffs. So um, where is it? Like, for, yeah, in fact, just there down there and to the, to the left in the image, um, we go on a big thick rope dangling off, off the edge of the cliff in the middle of the night to, um, to well, I wasn't hunting the birds, but the, the men were hunting the birds. I was filming them doing it. But uh, yeah, it was probably the most terrifying thing I've ever done. But the, the rope's not tied onto anything. It's just held by a lot of, uh, um, a lot of guys. Uh, it's a very long rope. I think the cliffs are about 250 feet high and we go down probably 80 feet or so onto a ledge that's, that's about four or five feet wide and um, slippery and full of nests. And we wear helmets, but we're not tied on when we're down there. We thought we were going to go down for an hour. Um, we were down there for, I think, eight hours. So um, plenty of time to film and uh, contemplate your mortality. Uh, when the sun comes up, you can see exactly where you are because, of course, for most of it, we're in pitch black. Huh? So, um, but it was a real, a real um, privilege. Uh, it was an incredible experience to go down there and, and witness it. And uh, you will see all that in the, in the film but that though the, that, that's the cliffs where the gannets live and that that was the connection to um to Sulisker. Sula mean Sulisker means gannet rock in um what is essentially Faroese what which was Nord to the Scots and what, what's this I mean, this well this is the um the esteemed uh, artist Trondor Patterson from the Faroe Islands whose um glass birds adorn Copenhagen Airport and many other places, um, and that that's the ferry that links the South Islands to the to the main islands. Um, and Trondor is there in a reconstruction. It was the maiden voyage actually. I just stepped off the ferry from Denmark after thirty seven hours at sea, getting there. We literally stepped off the ferry and drove down. We were told this boat was going out and jumped on this boat. And it's a it's the longest. Um, um, sort of Viking longboat reconstruction in the Faroe Islands. I think it's a 12 oar, maybe it's more than 12 oars, but it was um, it was a fantastic wooden vessel that they, they've built. So we were out there in this traditional vessel with all these very modern craft plowing around, you know, kind of, it's a very Faroese uh, combination of things. It's a, it's a very, it's an incredibly successful mix of the new and the old yeah. on the islands. Okay, well, let's jump forward. That's uh, one of the hunts for seabirds, yeah? Yeah, Guillemots. Yeah. Um, an incredible hailstorm came in, and you can see to the left is sort of hell, and on the right is heaven. It was still nice weather over to the right. Yeah. Uh, uh, next the next month, day, yeah. that's, that's, that's our, um, our whale hunter, barter and we're out there looking for a different type of bird for filmers um young filmers in fact so before they can fly they kind of f flop into the water or they're, they're too fat f they're too fat to fly so they um they sort of bob around in the water until they've burnt off that baby fat and then they, then they can fly but they can't fly if they're grabbed by a guy with a net and eaten and so that is what's going on here collecting young fullers for, for for roasting and food and they're actually they're they're pickled the same way as the, the gannets are in scotland mm -hmm. okay that is um a special 
lance that was designed to try and minimize the time to death to, to kill the whales. Um, they were being developed, well, they were developed before I started filming, but um, there were various models of them. And um, if it's done properly, it's, it can sever the spinal cord um, very quickly. It's, uh, it's quite something to see an animal that size dispatched the way it can be when it goes right. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the tool for it. Yeah, that's one of the hunters. This was an actual hunt. You can see the water behind us is red, and um, the adrenaline is pumping. There was a pause because half of the pod got split up, and so it, it, the hunt that we filmed, uh, because sometimes they're over in six minutes. One hunt I filmed was over, well, maybe it was 10, 10 minutes or so, but this one went on for a good 45 minutes because the, the pod split in two. And then the second batch came in just after this. Um, and the adrenaline was pumping, but it really was something that the moods through the hunt were something quite unexpected, that there's a great calm and nervousness before they come to shore and you can't run down the beach too soon or you'll start all the whales and they'll swim away but there's also quite a task ahead for everybody and, and people want to do it as humanely as possible so quite a daunting thing um yeah. and then there's the charge into the water and then a level of adrenaline picks in which kicks in which is something very ancient that i'd not experienced before like that but um even being there with a the camera not not actually being in the hunt uh, it was very infectious kind of primordial uh adrenaline in the hunts and so everyone's hey, we're all in very cold water there but you don't really feel it at the time yeah okay listen so shall, shall we jump ahead a little bit mike because mm -hmm. it's fascinating as it is the film isn't really entirely about whale hunting, is it? You know, there's another no. story going on <laughs> here, uh, which is much more uh, dramatic, shall I say, without trivialising the, uh, the the subject of the whale hunting. Um, if you move you know, on... The whales were a messenger, really. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, a central character in the documentary is this gentleman here. Uh, and it's probably best if we invite Paul in at this point and uh, you can reveal to us um, more about your work, Paul, that you've been undertaking with regards to uh, whale meat and the amount of mercury in them. Yeah, <clears throat> I've been working on um, the, the, the pollution of the oceans on um, the children's house in the Faroes for for more than 30 years. I started in the mid-80s collecting blood from others and we saw that um, the exposure to mercury was quite high and we started uh, uh, monitoring this uh, group of children for, uh, uh, for effects on the, on the brain and um, later on we we included uh, substances like uh, persistent organic pollutants like PCB and other, and now lately the, the fluorinated compounds, and I looked at different organ system, for example, the, the, uh, the immune system, and we can see negative effects related to uh, the contaminants in marine food. And that is, when I say marine food, it is high in the food chain, that means, in seals and in whales and in uh, tooted whales like pilot whales. So in a way, uh, this research work has been for internal purposes to, to give advice to, to, to the fairies uh, women primarily, but also to the general population. That's one thing. But the second purpose is, of course, to document the effects are uh, which are related to, to this uh, prenatal exposure, this exposure in mother's womb, and send the message to the world, because this is not local pollution, this is uh, global pollution, because what we see is that all these um, toxic substances will end up, end up in, the, in the big oceans and will, and will concentrate in the food chain from 
from small bacteria up to uh, the marine mammals, for example, as in our case. Meg, you said something uh, in a, an article uh, piece which uh, stated that the pharaohs are the canary in the coal mine of what's to come for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, was, um, that was our way of saying that um, what has happened with our children can happen with other, in other uh, societies as well. And um, these um, subtle effects on our children could be a messenger about the bigger problem that we actually are accumulating toxic substances in the big oceans where they are out of control. Details concerning um, the experience of making uh, the, the film uh, to where we are now, because we're a few years down the line uh, Paul and and um, what's what's changed? Has anything changed in terms of local awareness? When uh, when, uh, when I came to the Pharaohs and started filming um, around this um, controversial pi uh, pilot whaling, the slaughtering of the whale with with a lot of international protests, I was a bit afraid afraid that um, that um, he would not be well received. But what we saw actually, that, and especially after the film was finished, that both sides, both, both the pro whalers of the Pharaoh, which is the majority, and the, the, uh, the people who are asking people not to, to eat uh, pilot whale meat and, and blah, blah, and, and, and as a consequence of that, not to, to slaughter whales. What we saw that both sides actually um, accepted the film as a fair uh, uh, description of our culture, both the, the mailing and but also all the uh, the whole culture around it. And um, I think um, if the yes, uh, seen from my point of view, uh, it was um, um, the film uh, contributed to to make uh, people in the fairs aware about uh, this problem. I had communicated myself a lot uh, in, the, in direct contact with several thousands of mothers and, and families, so uh, it was well known. But I think it, to me it was good to, uh, that it came in this, uh, uh, um, in, this uh, uh, in this film like a, in a, as a more holistic piece of a story, including even the Hultifak, the supernatural part of, of this society. And I think um, that, uh, but what has happened, there is still, um, uh, what we have seen in the pharaohs lately is that the concentration of uh, mercury in the, uh, in women who are uh, planning uh, uh, pregnancies and in pregnant women, the concentration actually are, are, are falling. That means that they are sticking to our, our advice not to eat it because the concentration of mercury, for example, in, in pilot whale meat is still the same. It has not uh, gone down. It is uh, around the same level as 20 years ago. So that uh, if uh, we see the blood level going down in women, that means that uh, they have changed their habits. And, and that is actually what the film is about, that uh, it's a family tension because the man in the family, the hunter, he wants he want to continue his, his habit and, and the wife, the, the nurse, is a bit concerned. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I think that the film did it in a very gentle way, in a very polite way to intervene in that uh, interfamiliar discussion. Yeah, that's right. Then you had the viewpoint of the grandfather as well. Yeah, which, which I appreciate because I could be the grandfather saying the same thing, a yeah. bit gr grumpy, but um, but um, okay. But I think I think that was a, uh, he has been a, with his camera, a remarkable fly on the wall where he could really uh, record uh, 
all this uh, uh, very personal opinions. I, I appreciate that. I think this is what this is one of the big qualities of the film that um, the people he was filming were so uh, uh, so accepting to him to have him at the table that they uh, they were living as as they usually do. I think that is a really a, um, a, a great achievement of the filmmaker, Mike. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> yeah, great, great deal. Thank you for letting me at your table. It was in stuff. Now, when you first went to the Faroe Islands, Michael, you hadn't went there with the intention of making this documentary. Could you tell us something about your first encounters with Pal and how how the film came came to be from being in the Faroe Islands to thinking I'm going to make a documentary about this? Anything you could tell us? Well, I went. I, I went there on a on a scouting trip to see if it was feasible because um, I mean I had been told that people would smash the camera on the beaches and that the hunts could be on any island and you might not get there in time and on, on, there were a lot of logistical things that I was told it was impossible to even make it um, and then I ended up in the house by coincidence next door to Paul so he came over for a cup of tea and we started talking about the science and. Um, and the implications of it, I mean, the, 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 a lot of the, the substances which are in this um, study, they've, they've only, they were, they're man-made, the, the polychlorinate biphenyls and things, they've only been around for 70 years. And this, te- this um, study has taken 35 years and is in- incredibly unique and it's longitudinal, but also just in the fact that it's studying something that hasn't been studied that in depth before. So it was completely a universal story in this place. Um, and of course, it's just it's an amazing part of the world to spend time in. So it was always really great to be there. I didn't think that I was going to end up spending four years. I mean, I spent 12 months spread over four years, but um, I don't think anyone expected me at their dinner table for that long when I started either. But um, yeah, it, it, um, it was clear from the first trip there that, that I, I was completely committed to this. Yeah. So it's something of a collaboration, it would seem to some extent, with through the, the research and the hard work and the perseverance of Pal himself as a Faroese member of the community, which quite a challenging undertaking. Yeah, well, it's always uh, a yeah. I think, and what was um, I was um, I was quite impressed that um, he didn't come as a foreigner with a with a finished story he wanted uh, just to prove. He came as an explorer with a camera in hand and a microphone and just starting, uh, uh, starting filming and, uh, and make um, this documentary over the years. And uh, when, when at the end of the process, it was my impression that he might up, made up, made uh, up his mind to, to, to tell the story and what the story should be. It was not pre, Precomposed, and I like that because that is a, a kind of a scientific approach as my my own. That uh, let's see what the, what what I find in nature and to tell us about afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So you never set out to make an environmentalist film, uh, Mike, but I think uh, the people, the number of people who must have seen the film now and heard from Pal and uh, been affected by the film that, it, that it's raised uh, increased awareness around about the toxification uh, in our oceans, which is a very, very urgent, urgent issue. And we cannot underestimate that. But I'm aware that Pal needs to go because he's got to give another talk very soon. Is there anything you'd like to uh, uh, say to one another before we say cheerio to, to Pal here, Mike, Pal. No, t- thank you for uh, for um, showing this um, as a, showing this film again and, and discuss it because I think this is I was I was uh, quite satisfied and 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 I am uh, I want to thank Mike to, that he had the the courage and. Um, and uh, and he actually finished the work, and uh, and now I think this is a a good 
a good documentary over a, a, a bit difficult uh, period in the Pharaoh's whaling history. My prediction is that the, the whaling in the Pharaohs will stop. It's, uh, I, I, perhaps it's wishful thinking, but I think it will stop soon, mm -hmm. 10 years or so. It has, whaling, pilot whaling has been in, uh, in the British Isles and in Iceland before, but it's, we are the only place practicing it still. But um, so this is, um, I think this is a very sober documentary of what was, what was going on here in, in the beginning of the 21st century. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Paul. It's a real You're welcome honor for you to meet. Thank you. And you can, you may go now. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for getting in touch with Paul and uh, getting him to 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 join us uh, this evening. I think that's quite a no, not at all. It's great. We've um, we've been doing these for a while, and it's. Um... In know, real life, though. To amplify his story and his life's yeah. work, he spent thirty-five years doing the study I spent four. So, yeah. yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add there? You know, like since the film has been made and it's been seen, any kind of changes that have happened that's that's worth noting, either concerning the environment or to do with hunting itself. Well. Um, there has been an enormous change since I started the film in, um, well, it's 11 years ago now. I started in 2011 and um, I was angry when I started making the film at these seabirds that were, we were, were one of the characters that's not in the trailer, he's examining the seabirds because it's sort of another parallel story. They're full of plastic and their, their stomachs were having 40 pieces of plastic in them. It was piercing their stomachs and these birds are flying around in agony and dying slowly. And the awareness of those things then was just nothing like it is now. And in 2018, when the film was in British cinemas, it was absolutely the talk of the day. It hit the cinemas when that was a, a, a mainstream conversation, plastics in the oceans, um, acidification of the sea, which was also killing the bird's food, and, and um, pollution in the sea, and, and, and in general, just an awareness. that I was infuriated when I began that there wasn't the awareness. And so um, it's great. It's it's really, um, I mean, there's not enough happening on it, of course. And the powers that be could move a lot swifter. We've seen with COVID the ability of us to throw vast uh, sums of money and human logistics at solving problems. We're extremely capable of it. So it's still incredibly frustrating to see the lack of that being applied. Um, but you really need to have a gun put to a government's head to do anything. Yeah. Um, so that is um, that is still frustrating. Yeah, but um, but the conversation has changed dramatically around it in the course of while well, I was making this film. The United Nations used the the, the film to help um, ratify the the Minamata Convention on Mercury Emission Reductions, and I mean there weren't a, a topic like. Um, low dose long term exposure to environmental contaminants isn't usually a very sexy topic and the thing that the whales brought um, a, a medium that was was very dramatic and, and grabbed attention because people that story was grabbing the attention perhaps for the wrong reasons because also when I started making the film the amount of anti whaling information that was just factually completely incorrect was staggering and you, you, there's even Anthony Hopkins narrating a piece in the 80s for Greenpeace where they're saying this is an annual festival and a rites of passage to become a man and that once a year all the whales come in and they herd them and kill them I and mean, it's complete fiction it's completely wrong I mean I, I wasn't trying to um, change anyone's minds on whether the hunt was right or wrong but rather to put things into to, to context and who the who the bad guys were when we have polluted those things in that pristine place to a point where they're toxic. And also being blind to the fact that tuna and plenty of other things that are in the sea are half the level of the whales. So if you're looking at the parents feeding their children whale in the pharaohs, then feed your kid tuna twice and you're in the same boat. So yeah, we all put our heads in the sand to some extent. Absolutely. And it's the bad guys who do not appear in this documentary 
they're alluded to. It's what makes it kind of such a fine piece of documentary work. It's not imposing your position on things. It lets people speak for themselves. And that's very important from an objective point of view. I really liked a certain kind of poetic weaving of the narrative throughout the film as well, because it wasn't didactic. You had the storyteller figure, uh, the, 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 uh, the guy who stuffed birds and was uh, doing a lot of research uh, into the wildlife. I think it was his voice when he, when he said that, um, he said something along the lines uh, that the Anthropocene, where is it again? I've, I've, I've just lost it. That um, in the past nature was a giant and humans were so small. Mm, mm. Other way around, it mm. came in at the right point in the film. That statement. There's another thing that's quite intriguing is the reference to these mythical creatures, who uh, are guiding guiding lights of the Faroese, and I think they might be descendants of elves or some kind of. What are they called? What are they called? The Hulda folk, the hidden people. So they are kind of yeah, uh, yeah, a kind of an elven people. Yeah. Yeah. And they represent the the unknown and um, and the fear of the unknown, and it ties in with I suppose the idea and whaling in a way. If you look at whaling paintings uh, from back in the days of uh, that being important for for oil, um, they're 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 terrifying beasts, and they are far more powerful than you, and you might die hunting them. And it, nature is a cruel, horrible uh, monster in itself and, 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 and will take your life. <laughs> and of course, now you can go out there with an explosive tipped harpoon and, and wipe them out. And um, in the comfort of a, a stabilized ship. So um, that's the point. I mean, we're not long off the tipping point of where we are dangerously powerful compared to the planet. It's still a relatively new situation. And, and, and it's playing out in the pharaohs now. I mean, they didn't, traditionally dolphins were not hunted and it was only last year, one and a half thousand dolphins were herded in. It's very difficult to do that in a rowing boat traditionally because they're very fast and nimble, but with speedboats, you can, you can do too much and you can tip off at being sustainable and into something that's greedy or for the thrill of the hunt. Um, there is a there's a there's a danger there of managing the increased power. Yeah. So it's not quite a clear cut issue, is it? You know, with regards to the pilot whale hunting, which is um, a lot of local people will say that's a that's a sustainable food source. Very unlike how we source our own food here. Uh, yeah. For example, you know that we get from supermarkets. It's pretty harrowing scene when you see the pilot whales being uh, killed in that way. But as you've pointed out in an interview before, you don't see the blood that comes uh, as a consequence of slaughtering animals in abattoirs. It all goes down pipes. You know, it's, it's much the same. And also the eating of whale meat in the Faroe Islands may be akin to eating deer meat in Scotland. So... It's an interesting well, yeah, yeah, it wasn't, um, I mean, if it wasn't for the whales, there probably wouldn't be a fairies population because it was the, the main source of vitamin C and many other things. And during winters, it was, yeah, it's it kept them, and for a long time, the population was around 10,000 people and the whales were a critical food source. And now they have, of course, their supermarkets with everything, but equally, yeah, we don't need to hunt deers either. Yeah, absolutely.